there is not a solution to the problems we face other than expanding the influence of Christianity, taking that biblical worldview and sharing it more broadly. I'll, I'll tell you the secret sauce. Stop worrying about the White House and get busy in your house and we'll get this fixed, right? That'll do it. That'll change the whole deal. So we can do this. All right, our offertory prayer tonight, we're not passing offering plates. COVID kind of interrupted that and we've learned to survive without it. But the corporate prayers of God's people change everything. And tonight I think we ought to pray for the people in the path of that hurricane. Um, that's a serious storm. We lived in Florida once upon a time before we came to God's country. <laughs> I was almost 16 before I could spell Murfreesboro. So it's, uh, <laughs> that says more about me than Murfreesboro, but let's just not go there. But, but that's a, it's an intimidating storm. And the, the God who created the heavens and the earth is still in charge. So if, if we were in the path of that, I would want somebody praying on our behalf. So why don't you stand with me? If you're watching on home, that you need to stand up. Put your pizza down. Stand up. Focus on the Lord for just a minute. You can go back to eating while I'm talking. When Mr. DeBerry comes up, no more pizza. Okay. The corporate prayers of God's people change the course of nations. And we have overlooked that for too long. But we're learning. We're back in school. Hallelujah. How many of you have a friend or family member that lives somewhere in the path of that storm? Look at that. Okay, so this is not some abstract prayer. All right, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the freedom and liberty we have to gather in Jesus' name without fear of reprisal, Lord. We, we thank you for that. But we come tonight to acknowledge that you're the creator of all. Lord, you created the earth and the heavens and all that's in them. And nothing is beyond you. And we ask for your mercy now on behalf of our nation. Lord, that storm that is, has begun to, I pray for those people that are at risk that you would protect them. I pray for those that are serving on behalf of others, Lord, that your angels would stand around them. Those that are frightened, I pray you would comfort them. Lord, I pray that the impact of that storm would be mitigated. When the reports are given, they'll be amazed at the minimal damage, at the losses that came, Lord, that there'll be no logical explanation. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. I thank you that you're capable of stilling the wind and stopping the waves. And we cry out to you tonight and ask for mercy, not because we deserve it, but because you're a God who delights in showing mercy, even to the wicked. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, I have the privilege from time to time of introducing guests to you, um, but I'm particularly excited this evening. Um, I met John DeBerry some time ago, and after we walked away, uh, some mutual friends introduced us, and we walked away from that evening, and I said, I don't know when or how, but with God's help, we want to let him speak at church. And it's taken more than a year to get everybody's calendars aligned and all the things that have to happen to make that. But if you're not familiar with him, he served um, in the Tennessee State Legislature for 26 years as a representative from Memphis, as a Democrat. Hang on. <laughs> with a biblical worldview, as an unapologetic... I tell you over and over, it's not about political parties. It's about the condition of the hearts of God's people. But he has been an unrelenting advocate for families, for children, for the people of the state of Tennessee. Uh, he couldn't be defeated at the ballot box, and, but his biblical worldview was so strong that it made persons uncomfortable, so they found a procedural way to keep him off the ballot. And the Lord opened a broader door. He is currently serving as the senior advisor to Governor Bill Lee in the state of Tennessee. But the most important criteria is he's a man of God. And he is a treasure in the state of Tennessee. And I am honored to be able to introduce him to you here at World Outreach Church. And those of you that are listening elsewhere, help me welcome, if you will, John DeBerry.
Thanks, Pastor. Yes, sir. Thank I thank God so much every time he gives me an opportunity to talk to those who care about their creator, their brothers and their sisters, the world in general, and especially this country. And so I'm very proud to be here, to be with Alan and his wife and, and others who are here, Representative Mike Sparks, I saw him a moment ago, former Representative Donna Barrett is somewhere in the audience. And I want to bring you greetings from Governor Bill Lee, who said he would be here. But of course, he's in our prayers, and Alan has already prayed for him once, and we want, to, want you to continue to pray for him and his wife. Call their names. He and Maria are uh, struggling with health issues right now, and he is a good man, a prayerful man, a man of faith. He's the type of man that, whether you love him or hate him, He's going to stand on those things that are written in God's book as far as how he makes his moral decisions and the decisions that he makes for the state of Tennessee. So you keep him in your prayers. In 1865, an English author wrote a book. His name was Charles Ludwig Dotson. And he wrote a book that was called Alice Adventures in Wonderland. It was a book that has been around for quite some time. And as a matter of fact, there have been several movies made from it. And when my children were growing up, I thought I had had enough of watching that over and over. But then I had grandchildren. And I started all over again watching Alice in Wonderland. Uh, this famous children's fiction writer wrote this book about 1865, as I said. Alice fell into a rabbit hole, and having fallen into the hole, she meets a whole lot of anthropomorphic creatures. And in meeting those creatures, the white rabbit, the mouse, the duck, Bill the lizard, the mad hatter, the queen of hearts, but the one I want to talk about for a few minutes is the Chesser cat. Now, the Chancellor Cat, among others, are interesting characters in that book. Alice, who fell into the rabbit hole, is lost. She doesn't know where she is. She's in a strange land. So in going down the road, she eventually meets the cat who appears and disappears in the movie. And I'm sure that those of you who have raised children have seen that movie. And she looks up in the tree, and she sees the cat, and she says, Sir, sir, which way should I go? I'm lost. Sir, which way ought I to go from here? The cat smile appeared first, and then the full cat appeared. He says, well, where are you going? Where do you want to go? She said, sir, I don't know where I'm going. The cat disappeared and then reappeared. And he said, then it doesn't matter. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And when I think about it from that standpoint and looking at that and, and talking about it with my children and, and with other places around the country that we've had this discussion, we have become a society that is losing focus as to who we are, whose we are, and where we're going. America is becoming a nation with an identity crisis. We're becoming a nation. We don't respect our history. We don't respect one another. And most certainly don't respect the tremendous potential that we have as a nation that God has given us. And I'm glad that you're here tonight. And I hope that we can send a message around the nation that those of us who believe in the sovereignty of God, that God, our Father, created us from the dust of the earth, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became living souls because the God who had created living creatures, the God who had hung the sun on nothing, the moon on nothing, had flung the stars 
and to the sky. That that God who formed us is a God who loves us and has never forsaken us. When we think about our God and our Father in heaven, and we think about who we are and what we are, design demands a designer. Life demands a life giver. If there is order, there must be authority behind that order. But there are those today who are telling you that things just happen on their own, that everything is accidental, that we are the result of some type of evolutionary process that we crawled from the primordial ooze and began to change over a period of time to where we evolved from lower animals and apes and lizards and whatever. Personally, I don't go to the zoo to visit relatives. I understand that God made me. I understand that it was God who created the family. That God looked at Adam and God who had made an assessment on everything that he had created. God had said it was good, yea, very good. But one thing God said was not good. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. Therefore, God put man in a deep sleep. While he was in that sleep, he opened his side. He removed a rib from his side. He made the woman and placed her at his side, indicating she's not his slave nor his master, but another self brought alongside so that she can be his counselor, his helpmate, another self to be there with him. When Adam, who had looked at all the animals that God had made under the guise of naming them, had found nothing that really attracted him. But when he looked at the woman, and I'm sure that Alan can tell you from the Hebrew vernacular, he looked at her and he goes, now, which is the equivalent of, wow, God, you have done something now. He said, she is bones of my bones. She is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish, a woman because she was taken out of man. Then God gave Adam the privilege of being the first prophet, the first man to speak in perpetuity what God intended for the family and the family being the foundation of society. Adam said, therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. There, Adam, who didn't have a mother or a father, but was made full grown, and so was Eve. God spoke to all of us. This is the foundation of society. The family is the foundation of society. That's the reason why those who want to destroy us distract us, demoralize us, demoralize us, disillusion us, divide us, will always attack the family. The family is what holds us together. It's what gives us our faith, gives us our training, gives us our understanding of who we are. We have the most spiritually illiterate generation in the history of this nation. We have a generation that don't know who Jesus is. They don't know who George Washington is either. And this is something that we should not embrace as a continual fact. But those of us who understand God's blessing to this nation should do everything we can to change that by educating our children. We have lost our way and we've got to find our way again. That was a time when regardless of who we were, our ethnicity, whether you were black, white, red, yellow, polka dot, or pinstripe, everybody understood that all of us have got to work together if we're going to build, strengthen, change, and save this nation. Martin Luther King made in one of his speeches he said, understanding, even during the civil rights movement, even during the times when the nation had separation 
and, and we had all types of issues that we had to deal with. Martin Luther King said, we may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And as he looked at this nation and the time when there was upheaval and there was time when we embarrassed ourselves as a nation, as we failed to look at what brings us together, but we lifted up those things that divide us. We have come back to that time again in the history of our nation where we accentuate and maximize the things that divide us, the things that destroy us, and the things that keep us apart. Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first to say it. Jesus, our Savior, was the first to say it. He said that a house, a house, divided against itself cannot stand. It cannot stand. When we divide ourselves from within, when we corrupt our esteem for one another, when we destroy love between brothers and races and ethnicities and cultures to the point that we build up hate, Right now, little children in early grades are being taught to hate one another. Right now, we are telling them those things in history that only destroy and divide. Let me tell you something. This nation was saved by a generation in World War II, a generation of men and women, many of whom went to Asia and went to Europe and fight fought and spilled their blood all over the world to save this nation. Those who didn't leave planted victory gardens. They gathered rubber and rags and iron and metal. In other words, the whole country pulled together to save this nation, understanding that America most certainly was worth saving. And when we think about this, We have come to a point to where maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years, if we're fortunate, perhaps the day will come when we'll have to look at those same young people who are sitting in classrooms right now being taught to hate each other, that we're going to have to ask them to defend this country. Let me tell you something. A man will not die for that which he does not believe. Peter was an old roughneck fisherman who could stand on a rickety ancient boat and pull hundreds of pounds of fish. Peter was no little guy. He's a big, burly, strong fisherman. But when the Lord was being led to his death and Peter had a different opinion, he thought the Lord should fight. He had pulled a dagger and swinging to cut off a man's head and cut off his ear. Lord said, put that thing down, boy. You're a fisherman. You're not a swordsman. They're going to kill you. Lord put the man's ear back on and went to his death. But you know what? He had told Peter three times, three times you're going to deny me. Three times you're going to say you don't even know who I am. Peter is saying, no, Lord, not me. I'm your man. I'm your rock. I'm solid. I'll die for you. But Peter lost his faith. He had watched Jesus raise dead people. He had watched Jesus walk on the water. He had watched Jesus call a man's name, and he walked out of the tomb. He had watched Jesus take a little boy's lunch and feed a multitude. He'd watched Jesus go to lepers when everybody else was running and cleanse their skin like the day that they were born. He watched Jesus make men who had never made a footprint in their life jump up and skip like children. Eyes that had never seen the sun look up and see the birds in the sky. Now he's going to allow himself to be killed? No, dude, I can't go along with that. No, uh-uh. No, I can't go along with that. You were with him. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. You speak that same old Ebonics he speaks. Nope. He cursed and swore and said, no, I was not. Why? Because he was afraid? No, he lost his faith. 
A man won't die for what he don't believe. We're going to teach them to hate the country, hate the Constitution, hate one another, hate the flag, hate everything about America. And then when we're in a crisis, say, look, take this gun, put on this uniform, and go and die for this country. No, it's not going to happen because we have sabotaged our own future by what we're teaching our children. In 1956, in Miss Riley's class, Dunn Avenue School, I stood in the first grade beside a beautiful wooden desk in a beautiful school that I would put up against any schools in the world. Miss Riley's class was beautiful and well decorated. And she said, when you come to my class, you better have your hair combed, your clothes pressed, your shoes shine, and I don't want to hear ain't or no other words that I'm not teaching you. But you know what I remember most? I stood beside that desk and said a pledge that my father, a Korean War uh, era veteran, had already taught me in his office at home. I put my hand on my heart and I pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I probably said New United States at that time, but of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, help me, indivisible, finish it with liberty and justice. Don't you know that as a young black kid, even called colored in 1956, that we understood that this was our country, our nation, and there was nothing better, so let's stay here and fix it. What, that's what we have to do. My father told me when we integrated the schools, uh, we were talking about it a little while ago. When my father told me when we integrated the schools, I said, what did we do? 1968, he had gone to Washington with Dr. King and others in that first march on Washington. We watched it while that man stood there and said, I want my little children to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And for this reason, our folks built our character, taught us how to be God's people and godly and faithful and obedient to the laws, understanding, as Paul said in Romans 13, that all authority is given by God. We were taught that. But I want you to understand something, that Dr. King, when he said that he wanted his children to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In 1968, my dad sent us to integrate the schools. We said, what do we do? And then he called me Nick. He said, Nick, go to school. I said, yeah, okay. My other brothers and sisters, six of them, they all looking at me like, talk to the dude, talk to him, you know. Now, what do we do when we go to that white school? He said, go to school, we're having dinner. And my, my brothers and sisters looking at me like, Come on, talk to him. I said, Daddy, what do we do? He laid his chicken leg down, laid his fork down, and gave me a look that I saw a thousand times until I was 18. He said, Nick, you go to school. You don't scratch your head when it ain't itching. You don't grin when it ain't funny. He said, be a man. Be a man, boy. He said, if you give respect, you'll get respect. You go to school. That's what he told us. In Alamo, Tennessee, Crockett County, little bitty city up there, while other folks acting a fool all over the country, integration goes without a hiccup in a little small city. You know why? Because of what he said. These children have been raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They have parents that are fair-minded. We had been in that city for several years. He had made friends with people. They understood what he stood for. They understood what he would fight for. Even if they didn't agree, they respected him, and things went very well. If we're going to save our nation, 
then we've got to get back to the time when we stop being divided. Our enemy, our enemy, Google it if you don't believe me, in 1963 said, we're going to take your country. I said, we're going to take it. And we're going to take your country without firing a shot. He said, we're going to do it. We're going to make black folks hate white folks. White folks hate black folks. Rich folks hate poor folks. Southern folks hate northern folks. The illiterate hate the educated and so on and so forth. They gave this great plan for taking our country away from us and telling us we're going to hand it over on a silver platter. Since 1963, they've been working that plan. They have been dividing us from within. They have planted the seed of malice and wrath and hatred and prejudice and distrust. It's been planted and it's growing and producing the fruit of division and disillusionment all over this nation. It's time for us to take an introspective examination of ourselves and realize something where we're going that we're lost and we're going in the wrong direction. In the book of Proverbs chapter 14 and verses 34, Solomon in his wiser days, Solomon called the laboratory of human experience. He had more stuff than anybody who has ever lived. But you know what Solomon said? He said righteousness, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach or a shame to any people. And when we become a nation, that as Jeremiah said one time, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? He said, no, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. We're becoming a society that has lost its ability to blush. We see nudity, we hear profanity, we see all types of corruptive and corruption and perverted and inhuman. We see all types of things paraded before us in the media and we have become so used to it, so desensitized that we don't realize that the devil is gradually desensitizing us so that we can die. All of us have heard the illustration of the frog in the petri dish because he's amphibious, I think that's right, isn't it? And when as the water heats up, he doesn't realize what's happening until it's too late. And that's where many of us as Americans find ourselves right now. We don't realize just how compromised we have become, just how dangerously divided we have become because we have leaders that will not stand for what's right. In the book of Proverbs chapter 11 and verses 11, Solomon teaches us that a nation is exalted by the example of the upright, of the upright. We've got to be salt. We've got to be light. We've got to show the difference between the holy and the corrupt and the profane because we stand. Paul said something in the book of Romans chapter 12 and verses 2. Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Apostle Paul wants us all to remember, we want things to change on the outside before we change things on the inside. It is only when we change our minds that things are going to change in this nation. Too many of us have taken the path of least resistance. You know, water, I remember that test in 10th grade physics about water always taking the path of least resistance. And when you look at the Mississippi River, over decades and centuries is a crooked, meandering body of water. Why is it crooked? It's crooked because water takes the path of least resistance. 
and America's becoming a crooked nation, unable to walk in the straight and narrow, unable to stand straight before our God because too many of us capitulate, compromise, and give in to those things that are happening around us rather than standing as God would have us to stand. In the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verses 2, you know what Solomon said? Solomon said, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. That word mourn in that context comes from a Hebrew word which means suffer. Are we suffering enough yet? Is it hurting? Jerry Clower, one of my favorite comedians, he told a story one time, and, and you know, Alan, going up and down the expressway, he was one of those that kept me awake and lucid while I was driving. He told a story one time. He says that, and I may have the names wrong, but he said the old Clem had been plowing all day, and he kicked his boots off, his broke hands off, and he's sitting there twiddling his toes with the dust falling off his feet where he'd been plowing behind a mule all day. And so old Bubba was up the road, and his dog was just hollering, oh, oh, Clem tried to ignore it, but he just got louder and louder, oh, 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 finally, he put his boots back on, walked up the gravel road, he said, Bubba, what's wrong with your dog? He said, ain't nothing wrong with him. I can talk like that, I'm from Crockett County. He said, ain't nothing wrong with him. He said, well, why are you making all that noise? He said, he all right. He just sitting on the nail. He said, sitting on the nail. Oh, why don't he get off the nail? He said, he'll get off her. It just ain't hurting him bad enough yet. <laughs> so the question is for America. Oh, look at our children. Whoa, 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 look at our homes. Whoa, 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 look at our school system. Whoa, 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 look at Washington, D.C. Whoa, 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 look at everything that's happening. Is it hurting bad enough yet to get off the nail and do something about it? That's what we've got, where we've got to find ourselves in this nation. In the book of Proverbs 28 and verses 12, Solomon said, when righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is sought or a man is hidden. He's saying, who's going to stand in the gap? Who's going to be the person who refuses to compromise and capitulate? When Joshua was about to die, that good man looked at God's people and he saw a weakness in them. And he said, if it seem evil for you to serve the Lord, choose, 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 he said, this day, who you will serve. What are you going to serve the gods of Egypt who made you slaves for 400 years or the perverted gods in the land that God sent you to take over and clean up? He said, choose. But then he said, what every man, every man in this room, every strong woman in this room ought to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My daddy used to say in a sermon, he would draw an imaginary line in the sand in the pulpit. And he would say to the men, you tell the devil, he don't go another further. It stops right here. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to become the people who stop it and don't allow it to continue to destroy our country. Right now, right now, because we have lost our way, we have the sin sick, the spiritually starved, the morally depraved, the mentally abused, the scripturally illiterate, the emotionally wounded, the politically perverted, the physically neglected and obsessed. We're untaught, unraised, unkept, unchurched, and often uncooperative. Why? 
because we have violated a basic command of our Lord who said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I, I, America, I will draw all men unto me. When we go back to righteousness, when we find our way, when we start lifting up Jesus the way he wants to be, we will refuse to allow evil, corruption, and perversion to dominate our lives, our families, our schools, our children, and our country. But we've got to refuse. You've got to speak. You have to stand. And you and you alone can change it. Paul said that we should not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. When he was speaking to the folks at Ephesus, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what he told us to do? Put on the whole arm of God. Put on the helmet of salvation. Protect your mind. Protect your spiritual and scriptural heart. Don't let anybody and everybody have access to your spiritual heart. Paul said evil communication corrupts good manners. You know what that word communication means from the Greek? It means when you're pressed in with something, like two rotten apples. One rotten apple will rotten the next one. That one will rotten the next one. That one will rotten the next one till eventually you've got a barrel of rotten apples that started from one. It's time for us to have the guts to get rid of some rotten apples in this nation. All of us are two people. You're two people. You're the spiritual man. You're the physical man. You're the spiritual man that's fed by the word of God, the love of God, the care of God. You're the physical man that's fed by what John said when he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh the lust and desires of the eye, and the pride of life. In essence, what John is saying is the world has nothing to offer you but that. Jesus asked all of us a question. What's the price of your sellout? What's the price of your sellout? Is it your job? Is it your home? Is it prestige, power, position? What's the price of your sellout? Jesus said, what doth it profit a man? If he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord said, what's the price of your sellout? Because when he says, lose your own soul, he's saying you lost yourself. You lost the personality that made you godly and spiritual and obedient and humble and loyal and patriotic and hospitable. He said, all of that's gone because you bowed to the American idols that changed you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And Jesus says, when you got all of that, he says, and you lost yourself in the process, what have you gained? All of us must keep in mind at all times that God is watching us. Jesus said, I am the way. You're looking for the way you lost, I am the way. Israel wandered 40 years, they weren't lost, they were disobedient. And they wandered for 40 years because of disobedience. And we're wandering right now as a nation, wandering around in the wilderness of ignorance and shame and sin and perversion and corruption. And if we're going to find our way, Jesus says, I'm the way. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No man come to the Father unless you come by the way that I have laid out. And Peter said he knew no sin and he overcame the world. 
And so therefore, understand this, that the first casualty of war, and you're at war, and the first casualty of war, it was said by Colin Powell, it was said by Schwarzkopf, it was said by others, other generals in war, that the first casualty of war is the truth, the truth. Those who fight us will always lie, always spread propaganda, always disillusion, distract, doing everything possible to destroy. You're at war. Didn't you know it? Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, keep your eyes open, stop getting blindsided. He said, for your adversary, that word adversary means opponent, as a roaring lion walking about seeking, stalking, whom he may devour. But God didn't tell our country to run from the devil. He told us to put the devil on the run. He said, if you resist him, he will flee from you. So I want you to know this. We got to choose sides. We got to decide whose side we're on. Moses, as he watched the children of Israel after God had split the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground, he has destroyed the Egyptians' whole religious system. They worshiped the sun. God reached down and turned it off. They worshiped the Nile. God put his finger in it and turned it to blood. They worship their, their prosperity and their uh, fruitfulness. God destroyed it all. They worship the Pharaoh, and God even killed the Pharaoh's son. Now they're dancing around a golden calf, clothes removed, earrings and gold to build the calf, dancing around the golden calf as though the calf saved them. And in 200 years, when there are countries that got buildings 2,000 years old, 1,500 years old, that are still cutting off women's heads in marketplaces, that still publicly display slaves, sell their children like property. And in 200 years, yes, we've made some mistakes. But understand something. Just as Moses stood before Israel and asked the question, Who's on the Lord's side? Who's on the Lord's side? The Lord is asking our nation that question now. He's saying, come to me. All of you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will and shall find rest to your soul. The lies are there. They're trying to make merchandise of you. They want you to capitulate, compromise, leave it alone. Don't rock the boat. Don't shake the tree. Why don't you just be quiet and go away like good little Christians and shut up and let the real folks run the world? Why don't y'all stop claiming that there is a biblical standard of morality as though that matters? Why don't you stop espousing that the Hebrew scripture give an accurate account of man's origin? Why don't y'all stop opposing alternative lifestyles based on the writings of the Bible only? Why don't you stop defending your traditional views of marriage based on the teachings of the scriptures only? Why don't you stop denying your children access to alternative lifestyles, gender expressions, family structures, perpetuating your antiquated viewpoint from that old antiquated Bronze Age book you call the Bible? Why don't y'all just shut up and go away? That's what the world wants from you. You've got to decide who you're going to be, whose you're going to be, and whether or not you're going to stand where God wants you to stand. Eleanor Roosevelt, I want to read this to you. Eleanor Roosevelt carried a prayer in her wallet till the day she died. The prayer went like this. 
This is the wife of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who wrote this during the Second World War when so many of our great great grandmothers and grandmothers and grandfathers were fighting in those wars. Dear Lord, lest I continue my complacent ways, help me to remember that someone died for me today. And if there be a war, help me remember and ask myself, am I worth dying for? I remember the day that we buried my father in the Veterans Cemetery. And when I went back on Veterans Day to look at that marble shaft that tells me where his remains were buried, and I see those countless thousands of men and women who have given their last measure of devotion, their very lives for this country, many of whom suffered egregiously, many in prison camps, many who suffered so many horrendous injuries that the remainder of their life was terrible and suffering. And as she asked the question, and as we look around ourselves and with ourselves and among one another, we've got to ask the question, am I worth dying for? Am I? Are we? Are we worth dying for? We've got young men and women, 13 of whom were blown to bits just a year or so ago, blown to bits. Their whole life snuffed out. Those fine looking, they showed the pictures, I couldn't help but just cry. Couldn't help but just cry. Because their life snuffed out because they had the courage to put that uniform on and serve that, their country. We got to ask ourselves, are we worth dying for? Ron Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. He said, we don't pass it down to our children in the bloodstream. He said, it must be fought for, it must be protected, and it must be handed down to our children so that they can do the same as we have done. We've got to stop living all of the past and prepare ourselves for the future. When any group or tribunal has the power to censor our speech, regulate our thinking, demand our compliance, punish our defiance, prohibit our self-defense, suppress our vote and opinion, silence our voices, restrain or restrict our free will, we have already lost our liberty and forfeit, forfeited our freedom and accepted tyranny. It has been said that as Americans, our greatest treasure is our freedom and our will to defend it. Our children are just 25% of the population, but they're 100% of the future. And they need an example from us right now as to who they ought to be and what they ought to be so that they could enjoy the same things that we enjoy. Let me tell you something, parents. Don't spend all your time and effort trying to give your children what you didn't have that you forget to give them what you did have. We did have discipline. We had faith. I don't ever remember being asked if I felt like going to school or I felt like going to church. It just wasn't asked in my mama and daddy's house. They are our ambassadors that we will send to a time that we will not see. So understand something. We wondered. Martin Luther King said he had been to the mountain. A lot of folks stuck on the mountain. 
There are many who said that we have great potential. There are those who are still getting ready to get ready to get ready to do something. But if we're going to save America, we've got to return to righteousness and find ourselves. Those of us who believe, those of us who care, it's time to take lead so that America returns to righteousness. It's time that we as a people forgive ourselves of our past faults, our past flaws, failures, and fears. Let us return to righteousness, find our faith, and move on. It's time for us to release the bitter pill of eternal shame and self-pity and apprehension and accept the healing potion of self-acceptance self-esteem, self-awareness, self-appreciation, return to righteousness, find ourselves, and move on. It's time to cease and reject the self-debasing rhetoric and of beat down, defeated victims, and, and, and lift up the heroic anthems and affirmations of victors and overcomers, by the grace of God, return to righteousness and move on. It's time to stop groveling in the murky mire in the sinking bottomless pit of racial, ethnic, cultural, and national conflict, finger pointing and blame, divisive blame. Let's climb out of the pit of shame, walk upright, on the firm ground of consensus, camaraderie, and brotherhood, let's embrace our common faith, our common goals, our common dreams, return to righteousness, and move on. It's time that we as a people stop reliving our yesterdays, discounting and devaluing our present days, subverting and undermining our future days. Let's be thankful. Let's learn to live and love, return to righteousness, and move on. It's time that we as Americans realize that our strength resides in the collective faith and righteous might of we, its people. That our government, therefore, must give us what we deserve to succeed, protect and enforce the Constitution, get out of the way so we can move on. It's time to realize this, that you got a story, I got a story, and as my dad used to say, all God's children got a story. But we're still writing the American story. So let's each stop living our fears, our failures, our faults, our fallacies, our fantasies, our familiarities, our frailties, our foolishness, our flaws, our mess-ups. Let's stop living them and start living our faith. You cannot unwrite history. You cannot read write history. All you can do is learn from history and write a better future, and it's time for us to do that and move on. Amen. It's been said before, and I'm going to say it again. There is nobody. We're Americans. We're God's people. God has been good to this country. And nobody can save us, from us, for us, but us. Thank you. I told you. <laughs> now, the, the warning 
that we're given in Scripture is not to be hearers only, but to be doers. So can we ask the Lord to give us the wisdom that we live that out? Because we're dishonest if we applaud it and we don't live it. So we have an assignment. Why don't you join hands with somebody and we'll pray. We need one another. We do. If you don't know the person whose hands you took, t tell them your name. And if they won't talk to you, turn loose of them. Okay? Father, thank you. I thank you for John and his life and his service of your people and your church, of our state and our nation. I thank you for the reminder he's given us that you are our deliverer, that our freedom and liberty come from you. And I pray you'll awaken your people once again to that truth, that we will have the willingness and the courage to stand for what is right in the face of the antagonism that would promote what is evil. Give us wisdom and boldness. May we have a greater fear of God than we have of people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless you. Thank you.